Welcome to the Cyber Center for Biblical Studies. Hi, my name is Herb Bateman. Today we want to talk about a New Testament book, a, a letter that uh, was written by Paul to uh, a group of Ephesians. And we'll come back to this uh, letter uh, written to Ephesians later on in our discussion. But I have with us um, ben Simpson, uh, professor of New Testament studies at Dallas Theological Seminary, uh, to help us think our, our way through this letter to the Ephesians. Ben, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Herb, for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Well, let's let's get to the let's get right to uh, this letter. Um, if I were to ask you, what's the big picture? What's the overriding thrust of the of this letter to the Ephesians? What would you tell me? Yes. Um, well, the book of Ephesians is really, it's the main body of the book is broken up into two parts. The first part, uh, Paul addresses the believer's position with God. Um, as the believer is in Christ, uh, they have a new relationship with God. And the second significant part, uh, which begins in chapter 4 through the end of the book, um, really kind of spells out the implications for that, uh, how the believer should live in light of that new relationship. And so as the believer is in Christ, um, what are the ramifications for that ethically for the believer? Okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's um, with that in mind, let's talk about the historical situation uh, to which Paul is writing. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Mm -hmm. Well, traditionally, the book has been called the book, uh, to, uh, the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. And so traditionally, it's been thought that Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians. Um, but some of our earliest and best manuscripts um, uh, either leave that Greek word Ephesus out um, or supply another city. And so some scholars tend to think that maybe Paul wrote this as a circular letter, and so he intended it to be sent to various um, locations in, uh, in Asia Minor. And so it possibly could have been read in Ephesus, but as well, it could have been addressed to Christians in Smyrna or Philadelphia or Heriopolis um, or any number of cities along that uh, Lycos Valley. There. Okay. Okay. So it's sort of like uh, the seven churches maybe that uh, John was addressing. Possibly. Uh, okay. So you're seeing it more circular. That's more of a the historical setting for the book. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me um, ask what are the uh, some of the theological concerns that Paul has that uh, that seem to rise to the surface if you were to name one or two major theological emphases. Mm -hmm. Well I think probably the most significant um, emphasis that Paul is addressing in the book of Ephesians is this idea of or this tension between Jew and Gentile. And um, the fact that I think Paul wrote a circular letter, um, he probably had an opportunity to address this Jew and Gentile uh, tension at a broader level. And so unlike uh, another letter like the letter to the Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul was addressing specific issues. Um, he's able to address this tension at a broader level uh, for the Christians in those various churches. Okay. So the emphasis is how do two different people groups unite in Jesus? How are they united in Jesus? That's right. Okay. All right. Um, uh, all right. So here I am. I'm a pastor. And I'm sitting down and I want to plan out a preaching schedule for the year. And I um, haven't done anything in um, Paul's um, house arrest letters uh, like Ephesians. And so um, I want to contemplate and think my way through how might I go about preaching this letter, um, this circular letter, mm -hmm. uh, to, my, to my congregations. What, what suggestions might you uh, give me as to how I might approach it? Sure. <laughs> Um, essentially, what I would do in terms of approaching the book, there's 14 uh, distinct units throughout the book, um, also including the introduction, so where Paul gives his salutation to, to the believers, um, but also his conclusion where he's giving greetings to various Christians in the, com in the community. And so taking those two sections out, there's 12 main sections in the body of the letter. And so a pastor could walk through um, the book uh, unit by unit or paragraph by paragraph 
um, in about 12 weeks. Um, if they wanted to um, bring a number of those paragraphs together, they could do it in a little bit less time, um, possibly 11, 10 or 11 weeks um, as well. Um, the book, uh, as I mentioned earlier, really has two major sections. The first is this theological or doctrinal uh, uh, section that talks about the believer's position in relationship to Jesus. They're in Christ. Uh, probably the two uh, or the most famous uh, verse in Ephesians is Ephesians 2.10, which is a part of a paragraph, or 2.8 and 9, which is a part of a paragraph that talks about the believer's individual relationship in Christ. Um, even though we were once dead in our sins, we've been saved by grace. Um, and then uh, the second, immediately following that paragraph, is Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, which talks about the church as a corporate entity. And so Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, two peoples, Jew and Gentile, are made into one new man. And so what's fascinating about the second section where Paul talks about these ethical implications of this new relationship is he draws back on some of the, the propositions that he made in the earlier part of the book. And so one fascinating aspect is in Ephesians 4 where Paul is talking about, uh, he's pointing his finger into the chest of the Ephesians believers and he says, um, don't walk as uh, sons in the darkness. Um, you didn't learn Christ this way. Put on the new man. And so I think there's a reference in Ephesians 4, uh, 22, 23, and 24 to the new man, which points back to Ephesians 2, 15, where Paul talks about this new humanity. And so what he's saying in, in a kind of an elusive way to the Ephesians believers is live as, uh, as people in this new humanity, this, um, where there's no longer a Jew or Gentile distinction in Christ. And then at the end of the book, um, where uh, an, another famous passage that Ephesians is known for is where Paul talks about putting on various pieces of armor. Um, this idea of a new man comes up back again. And so what I think uh, Paul is alluding to when he talks about um, uh, shodding your feet and putting the breastplate of righteousness on and putting the helmet and, and the sword, he's talking about uh, being a part of the community and uh, learning how to live in this community. And so if you want to be saved, if you want salvation, salvation is in the community. And so it's really a tightly knit book. And um, a pastor could spend a long time working their way through Ephesians. But what Paul has done for us is he's given us very discreet paragraphs uh, that are generally about... 10 to, to 12 verses long. Okay. And if I remember right, when it comes to that armor section, it's not so much depicting the Roman soldier as much as it, Paul restating themes he has already mentioned previously, mm -hmm. and he just applies them to the armor and mm -hmm. this new person. Um, Oh, very good. Uh, good. Well, uh, so let's, let's talk about, uh, okay, you convinced me. Um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead. I'm going to preach Ephesians. Uh, what type of sources might you give me? What, what, what would you say would be your, uh, your primary source that you would go to? And then perhaps maybe two other sources you might use as you think your way through this desire to preach through Ephesians. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, probably the most, most primary source is going to be your Greek New Testament. Fair enough. And so um, I think, uh, you know, sticking to the text, you're going to see things um, that Paul's alluding to um, that you're going to miss in the English text. And so if you're preaching this to your congregation, I think being able to draw those, those uh, issues out for your congregation is going to be critical. Um, in terms of commentary literature, um, probably uh, the commentary I reach for the most is going to be Dr. Honer's commentary on the book of Ephesians. Um, he's the most uh, thorough commentator um, I've, I've read on the book. Um, uh, interestingly, he has, uh, uh, on the authorship issue of Ephesians alone, um, he surveyed um, commentators from Erasmus, um, to uh, commentators writing in 2001, 
and the book itself was published in 2002. Okay. Uh, so as soon as it was published, it was up to date. Currently, uh, commentaries that are writing, uh, commentators that write on the book of Ephesians consistently refer to Honer. And so it's what I would consider the gold standard of commentators on the, on the book. Honer does a great job um, walking uh, uh, the reader through the book of Ephesians clause by clause, explaining the syntax, explaining the TC issues, um, and, and he's TC, very exciting. And TC, you mean text Textual critical? Textual criticism. Yes, okay. Text critical issues. Okay. Um, another, uh, two other commentaries that I would recommend. Um, first is Clinton Arnold's commentary on the book of Ephesians through Z the Zondervan exegetical commentary series. Um, Clinton Arnold has done a lot of great work on background issues on the book of Ephesians. Okay. And so he does a great job of drawing the reader to some of those cultural issues as Western readers might be elusive to us. Okay. And then finally, I would recommend uh, Frank Tillman's commentary on the book of Ephesians with Baker exegetical commentary series. Uh, uh, Thielman does an excellent job drawing out the theological issues that kind of impinge upon the book. And so um, those are the strengths for those three commentators. And, um, and having those three commentaries on your shelf are really going to help you out as you walk through the book. Okay. Well, Ben, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me here. All right. And for you, thank you. And uh, if you're contemplating a, a desire to teach uh, or preach your way through um, uh, Ephesians, um, do keep in mind uh, Honer's commentary on the book of Ephesians published with, uh, with Baker. And I trust that um, you will have uh, a great day until uh, the next time we, we meet again. We'll see you.